Okay, hi. Um, welcome. Uh, today I wanted to make a, uh, hopefully a, a short video. I just want to give uh, an example of doing a uh, deadlock detection uh, problem by hand, okay? So, you know, and just do, doing this by, just by way of talking a little bit about the program assignment you're supposed to be working on this week um, and um, uh, talk about a few other issues. Uh, but before that, I do that, I just wanted to uh, say one or two things about some of the material from Chapter 6. So Chapter 6 was um, uh, mostly focused on um, just, uh, talking about deadlocks. So, uh, you know, it starts off by listing, you know, um, uh, defining some of the conditions that are necessary for deadlocks to occur in an operating system, okay? So the, the, there are three... Uh, necessary conditions that a, a operating system, you know, policy that an operating system must enforce in order for deadlocks to be able to, to be possible in an operating system. These are mutual exclusion, uh, hold and wait, and uh, no preemption. Okay, so uh, you know, among these, I mean, mutual exclusion um, uh, is is a policy that you have to have in order to support multi-programming in an operating system. You know, so I mean. If you have more than one process running at a time in an operating system, there's going to be certain resources that just can't be shared. So in that case, you have to have a mutual exclusion uh, mechanism like a semaphore um, or, so, or like a spin lock or something like, like was discussed in Chapter 5 that you can set up so that the process can first lock a resource be, um, uh, you know, before it can be granted access to use that resource and can unlock it when it's done. So that's really what mutual exclusion is about. Hold and wait, no preemption are also other policies that usually are very desirable and that you want to have in an operating system in order to make uh, the best use of the resources that you have in the system. So hold and wait is just the idea that uh, if, if a process uh, locks some resources, it, it might want to use them for a while, uh, but then later on it might want to request some additional resources, so get some more resources and then begin using them, uh, but keep a hold of the resources it has, okay? Um, so, you know, the alternative to that is to, is to force all processes to, to get all the resources they need up front when they start running, okay? And, and that can be inefficient in many ways. The book talks a little bit about that. Uh, no preemption is another policy, so uh, it's desirable that once a process um, actually has a resource locked, that the operating system doesn't force it to give up its resource uh, until it's done with that. So until the process is done with that and voluntarily unlocks the resource, the operating system um, should uh, avoid, it shouldn't uh, force it to, to preempt it and give up that resource, okay? So most operating systems um, uh, allow, you know, have these three policies, and if you have those three policies, deadlocks can occur in your system. They won't necessarily occur; they're not guaranteed to occur. They only occur if the fourth, fourth sufficient condition um, actually happens in the system. So, this idea of the circular weight uh, happens when there uh, exists a chain of outstanding requests and current allocations, such that each process in the chain holds at least one resource that's needed by the next process in the chain. So if you have such a chain, then, then you actually will have a real deadlock in the system, okay? So uh, chapter six then is all about um, strategies that you can use to deal with deadlocks. You know, so deadlocks are, are, are a real deadly problem uh, in uh, a computing system, in an operating system. So uh, there are three kind of levels of um, of, of ways that you can deal with uh, deadlocks. Um, from the most conservative to least conservative, uh, these are uh, deadlock avoidance strategies. So, um, and then, uh, or sorry, the, 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 the most conservative are uh, deadlock prevention strategies, okay? So uh, these basically are, are strategies, if you remove one of these uh, four conditions, so, for example, if you don't if you don't allow hold and wait, uh, so if you remove a condition two, uh, so in that case again, that like I was talking about, this would then be uh, whenever a process starts up, it has to request all of its resources up front. So, so if you don't have hold and wait, then deadlocks can't occur. Or you know, if if you remove this this uh, condition of, of of not allowing preemption. So in that case. Uh, if, if a process has a resource, you might preempt it uh, and, and force it to give it up, and, and then maybe it might have to roll back, and, and, re and, and the, the process might have to restart again. Okay, but, but those, those are the ideas of, um, of, of, of totally preventing deadlocks by removing one of these conditions. Okay? 
Um, that there's there are a certain set of strategies that are kind of in the middle in terms of being uh, conservative or uh, more liberal in terms of utilizing the resources in the system. These, these are known as deadlock avoidance strategies. So there's two main flavors of these. There's process initiation denial, um, or there's um, resource um, request, uh, resource allocation um, uh, denial um, strategies. Uh, the, the second one is also known as a banker's algorithm. Um, hopefully I'll do another video, I'll give an example of those, but those are in the middle. Now the, 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 the most liberal um, uh, way that you can deal with deadlocks, uh, the, the one that makes the best utilization of, of the system resources, is to just allow deadlocks to occur. So to allow all four of these policies and conditions to be present in your operating system, uh, and then if a deadlock occurs, though, then you then you possibly have to de to detect the deadlock and do something about it. So that's what we're going to talk about here next is. Um, uh, dealing with these deadlock detection um, strategies, okay? So, uh, as, or, or, you know, just allowing deadlocks to occur and then uh, uh, implementing an algorithm in your operating system to detect the deadlock and then maybe do something about it if, if the deadlock uh, is actually present in your system, okay? So that that's what you're supposed to be doing in your next um, programming assignment here. So this is the basic algorithm for the deadlock detection. This is what you're supposed to be implementing in your uh, programming assignment. So uh, it's just basic four steps. Uh, you start by marking processes um, um, that don't have any resources currently allocated. Um, and then you initialize a temporary vector. And then you're going to be searching for processes um, that currently don't have um, any outstanding requests. And if they don't have any outstanding requests, um, you kind of simulate those processes as being finished. Uh, and then, you know, you, basically what you do is you return, uh, you simulate returning all of the resources that they currently have allocated back to the system. And you just keep doing that uh, um, until, um, it, if there's any processes left over after doing that, that means that those processes, uh, you weren't able to simulate them finishing, successfully completing, so they must be involved in a deadlock if you get uh, through this algorithm uh, and, and not all of the processes are marked off yet, okay? So um, in, in your um, program assignment, uh, you're going to be dealing with um, processes that... Um, you know, so you're going to be actually dealing with a system that's in a particular state. So you, you're given a set of, of matrices and vectors. Um, so in particular, we're, we're going to be look, working with uh, the outstanding requests that are um, pending in the system, the current uh, resources that are allocated to the running process in the system, and the current resources that are available uh, in, in this available vector, which I'm going to be calling V in our um, programming assignment. Okay? So, um, um, in, in our um, current programming assignment, you have to implement the uh, deadlock detection algorithm. Um, so, so I give you your assignment. So um, let, let me jump down to here. So in your um, in this program assignment, you're giving again uh, .sim files that um, basically they, they just give you the initial the, the starting state of your uh, of the operating system. So if you look in the .sim files, uh, they're of this format. So the first line just gives you the number of resources and the number of processes that are in the system, okay? And then, um, so like, for example, if I have eight resources, the next line is going to be a, a, a set of eight integers that give the, um, the, avail the, the number of available resources for each of the eight resources in the system, okay? Uh, and then after that, you have the allocation matrix and the, and the uh, request matrix. So if I have seven processes, the next seven lines after the first line represent the allocation matrix, and each line represents the allocations for process uh, for the first process and the next process, and so on. And then the lines after that represent the uh, the, the the current uh, request, the outstanding request for the again for those processes that are in the system. Okay. Um, so, let me show you an example. So this is um, this is um, the the fourth process state uh, simulation that you have uh, for your program assignment. Uh, I actually broke it up by line, so there's no blank line. So if you look in .sim, 
uh, it looks like this. So the first line, again, there's, there's um, eight resources in this system, and there's seven processes. The first uh, line represents the um, available resources. Uh, so, so we've got eight resources. There's none uh, available for resource zero, none for resource one, and so on. I'm going I'm to start by naming the, the book names resources starting at resource one. Uh, in the program is assignment, um, we, we start the processes and the resources, we start indexing them at zero. This will make it easier if you're using a, uh, if using C arrays that, that where you start indexing C arrays at zero. Uh, to match your arrays to um, the notation that we use. So again, um, our available uh, resources here, resources 0 through 7, we've got none of resource 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, we've got one of resource uh, 3, and so on, okay? So then the next seven lines, one, line 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, represent uh, the, the seven processes. So this uh, represent the uh, the allocated resources for the seven processes in our system. So the first line um, are the resources allocated by process zero. The next line is the resources allocated by process one, and so on. Okay. And then the last seven lines are the actual out or are the outstanding requests in the system. You know, so these are the requests for process zero. So in j just you know, in this instance, so, so to go back, uh, the uh, process zero has one of resource zero allocated, one of resource two allocated, and one each of resource six and seven allocated. Um, and, and process zero has an outstanding request. Uh, it's asking to get one of resource one allocated. Okay, so that's the format of the system state that you have to uh, simulate here. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to show doing this state four uh, uh, by hand um, uh, here. So um, so here um, on the the board we've got um, that same uh, state four. Hopefully you can see it well enough. So we had our uh, initial um, uh, available vector for our eight resources. Our resources are numbered zero to seven, so we've got eight resources in the system. They're numbered resource zero through seven. This was the available vector that we were giving in, in this uh, fourth simulation. Um, and this was the, uh, the allocation matrix uh, here that was given and the request matrix. So again, we've got seven resources, so we've got seven columns. Uh, in both of these matrix, matrices, and uh, we've got uh, eight processes. Uh, or sorry, we, sorry, we've got eight resources. Uh, uh, so we've got eight columns uh, labeled zero through seven, and we've got seven processes. So the processes are labeled zero to six. All right. So um, so let's just run the um, um, the the uh, deadlock detection algorithm, okay? So again, it, 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 it consists of four steps. Step number one is we, we want to mark uh, each of the process that, uh, each of these processes that has a row of all zeros um, in the allocation matrix. So basically, all any process that doesn't have any resource allocated already has all the resources it needs in order to finish up. So we can just, um, um, uh, sorry, I, I mean, any, any process that, that doesn't have any resources allocated right now, um, 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 uh, won't, won't be involved in a deadlock, okay? So we don't need to consider a, a process that doesn't have anything allocated. Um, so for, for this, this one, so I'm going to just use, um, I'm going to use, I'm going to mark the processes uh, here I'm going to use my allocation matrix. I've been using an additional column to keep track of the process that I have uh, uh, marked. Uh, but actually, we don't. Uh, every process uh, in, in our fourth simulation has at least one uh, or more resources already allocated. So if you look in here, there's no process that has all um, um, uh, of resources uh, zero. It has nothing allocated. So we're not going to mark anything. Uh, so, so nothing gets marked. Uh, here in, in step one, okay? So step two is we want to initialize our, uh, our W vector uh, to be equal to the current step, 
state of the available vector v. Okay, we're going to be using the w vector again. We're, we're simulating um, uh, finding processes um, who have uh, requests outstanding that can be satisfied, and simulating those processes being finished off, and then returning the resources they have allocated back to the system. Okay, now, if we do that, if we were to, if if we simulate the pro all the processes that we can finishing off and returning their their resources back to the system, if we end up with some some processes that are left over that can't return, uh, they can't run to completion and return their resources back to the system, those processes must be involved in deadlock, okay? So here, uh, step two though, we're going to initialize W to be the same as V, so that's 001, 0001, uh, 2310 uh, um, in this case, okay? So, um, um, so now steps three and four actually represent a loop. So when you implement this uh, as some C code, you're going to have a loop somewhere that keeps doing this. So as long as uh, we keep finding uh, a process such that uh, that's not marked. So, so step three is we need to find a process that's not marked. So this is the first time we're going to be doing step three and four here. Um, so we first find a process that's not marked and whose row, um, uh, whose row, whose outstanding request, uh, his row in Q, uh, is less than or equal to W. So in English, what we're doing here is we want to find uh, some process whose outstanding request can be satisfied with the current available resources that we have. So that, that means that we need to find uh, a process who's, who's, who doesn't have any uh, outstanding requests that are, that are more than what's uh, uh, currently available uh, in the system, okay? So I get, we can make a list of, of the processes whose requests could be satisfied. So process zero, um, um, uh, process zero needs one of resource one. We don't have any of resource one, so process zero uh, is not a candidate. Uh, no processes are marked, so, so we can consider all the processes, but, but process zero is not going to be a candidate. Uh, process one uh, only needs one of resource three, and, um, um, and I'm going to label it. Resource zero, one, two, three. Resource four, five, six, and seven. Okay? So there is one resource three available. So, so process one, uh, potentially, we could select it. Okay? Uh, process two needs a resource two, and we don't have any resource two. So process two, we don't have enough available to consider it. Um, process three needs two of resource five, um, and we've got three of resource five available. So could consider process three. Um, process four needs a resource one. We don't have any of those, so, so that's not a candidate. Process five needs a resource seven. We don't have any of those, so it's not a candidate. And then process six uh, is only asking for one of resource four. It has just one outstanding request for resource four. Um, we've got some resource four, so process six would be a candidate. Okay? So among those candidates, um, uh, you can choose, it, it doesn't matter which one you choose, and the algorithm doesn't specify. Uh, I'll just always choose the, 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 the one with the smallest uh, index, so process one here. So we're going to mark, so step four is we mark process one. So um, um, I'm going to, actually I'm going to move my marks down here uh, um, to make it easier for my next step. So I, I mark process one. Um, I'm going to just put a one there to show that I marked it on my first time through the loop here, okay? So, so you mark process one, and then you simulate returning back the allocated resources. Um, so you add the corresponding row um, of, of, of process one's allocated resources back to W. So, so we look at process one's allocated resources, um, it's got two of resource three, two of resource four allocated. So I'm going to return two of resource three. Uh, so now I've got three of resource three and, and one of resource four. So now I've got three of resource four. 
We're turning those back. Uh, that, that's what step four, what, what it means by adding the corresponding row back in there. So, so now my available resources now are, uh, are, are this shown by W, okay? So then you just keep repeating that. So if, if I'm doing by, that by hand, um, I'm not done yet because I, um, I did find a process in step three, so I'm going to go back to step three and, and repeat step three and four again here. Um, so I won't go through it again by hand. So, so the, the, the idea is that since I returned resources, uh, additional processes might be uh, able, the re outstanding requests that couldn't be satisfied before might be able to be satisfied now. Uh, but it turns out in this case, so again, if you go through and look through the outstanding requ requests, uh, process zero still needs a one. Um, um, there's no ones available. Process one is marked. So now we've got a process that's marked. So we're not going to consider it. Uh, process two, uh, again, needs a resource two. We still don't have any of those. Process three, process three is still a candidate. Um, you know, it was a candidate before. More resources were added, so, so it's still any process that was a candidate before is still going to be a process, uh, a candidate. Uh, process four needs a, a one. We don't have any of those. Process five needs a seven. We don't have any of those. And process six is also still a candidate. Okay. So again, I'll, I'll, I'll choose process three now to, to return back its allocated resources. So we'll mark process uh, three. Um, So, so now process one and process three are marked, um, and we're going to re return re process three's allocated resources back uh, toward the W vector. So process three only has one of resource four uh, allocated. So resource four will, will get returned. So now we have four. Um, and we're going to repeat again. So our third time through the loop, uh, we do a three and four again. We've got uh, process one and three marked off now. Uh, again, we can check process zero. We still don't have re any resource ones left. Process two, we still don't have any resource twos left. Um, process four, we still don't have any resource ones. And process five, we still don't have any resource sevens. Process seven, uh, once, you know, once again, process seven, once a resource four, we got plenty of those. So we will choose process seven, um, I'm sorry, process uh, six. Process six here. Um, so we'll choose process six to be marked off. So on our third time through the loop, process six got marked off, and we'll return process six's resource back to the system. Um, so it's going to be returning one uh, of resource six back to the system. All right. So now our fourth time through the loop. All right. Uh, so again, we need to check, um, um, given our current state of W, are there any resources whose outstanding requests can be satisfied by the, the available resources that we have, all right? Uh, and the answer is no. Um, again, you know, we, we, we haven't returned back any of, of resources one or seven. So you know, process zero, uh, because well, there's no resource one, so, so it can't go. Uh, process two, there's no resource two resource twos either, so um, 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 it, it has an issue. Um, and process four and five, um, Uh, process four needs a resource one. Sorry, uh, process four needs a resource one. Uh, there's no, there's no resource one, so it still can't satisfy that one. And process five needs a resource seven. All right. So at that point, uh, step three failed. We didn't find a candidate uh, that we can mark off and re and return its resources. So um, by the algorithm, you know, if you read further in of the description of the algorithm. Uh, uh, we're done, and since unmarked processes exist, in this case we detected uh, a deadlock, so therefore a deadlock does exist, and the deadlock must, uh, uh, you know, so process zero, the unmarked processes, which are process zero, process two, um, process four and five, must be the ones that um, are involved in the deadlock, okay? So, so there must be a circular chain 
of resource uh, allocations and, and outstanding requests among those four processes that are preventing them from um, uh, completing and so, so they're in the deadline. Um, so um, one final quick thing there, I just wanted to show maybe the, uh, the, the, the resource allocation, an example of a resource allocation diagram, okay? So uh, given the same state information, um, we can actually diagram the, the, the state of the system um, and again show, um, you know, convince ourselves that a, that a deadlock um, actually exists or not in our system here. So, um, so we have all the information we need in our allocation matrix and request matrix uh, and available vector. So for example, uh, we've got seven resources. So in, in the, the book, in these, in these resource allocation diagrams, if I remember right, I use squares to represent the resources and circles for the processes. So you know, I've, I've got my, my seven resources, I'll just call them U squares, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. These are my seven resources. And this might get a little bit messy with, with this many processes. Hopefully you'll be able to see it. Uh, so, but, so, so let's look at um, process zero, okay? So process zero, we know that it has one, these are what it has allocated, okay? It's got a resource zero, two, six, and seven allocated. So uh, on these resource allocation diagrams, we use an arrow from the resource to the process to indicate um, a, a current allocation. So we've got a resource zero, a resource two, um, and a resource six and seven. Okay, so, so it has those four resources allocated. Um, I'm only going to draw the resources that, that uh, we found out were in, um, in um, the, the deadlock here. So process zero, uh, so let's look at process two next. So um, and I'm going to draw that one down here for reasons that we'll see in a second. Process two uh, has um, allocated one of resource zero. Um, and it has two of resource five. So the book actually, I can draw two arrows. Uh, I'm just gonna indicate that as I've got two or five. Uh, it's not um, uh, important uh, in this example. Um, process uh, uh, four and five, so process four. Um, let me draw process four here and, and show its allocation. So process four has a resource one allocated and uh, a resource four and resource seven. All right, and uh, process five then has a resource one, and that's all it, it has um, allocated, okay? Now let's draw in the outstanding request. So we use an arrow from the process to the resource to indicate uh, that it's requesting a, a lock of that resource, okay? So we're gonna go down to our request matrix for that. P0 has one outstanding request for resource one. Um, um, process two had an outstanding request for resource two. Uh, process four had a request in for one. And for a six. And uh, process five had an outstanding request for seven. All right. So um, that might be a little bit too messy to see. Hopefully uh, you can follow me a bit here. So basically that, that fourth, uh, the, the sufficient condition uh, corresponds to, the, there has to be a, you know, in this directed, if we think of this as a directed graph, there has to be a chain of, re of outstanding requests and allocations so that, so, so that I can uh, find a circle or, or a chain. So, I, so for example, if I start at process zero, 
um, you know, I can, I can, it has a request for um, um, resource one. Resource one has been um, allocated to process four. Uh, process four has a request for resource six. Um, and uh, resource six um, um, has been allocated to process zero. So there I found a circular chain that involved process zero and process four showing that they're in the deadlock. Um, and and uh, if I had gone a different route, we could have included five uh, in that chain. So process zero, um, if I would have had gone to, to resource one, and if I instead had then gone uh, to the, the um, allocation of resource one by process five, and then process five has a request for seven, and seven is allocated to four, and then four has a request for one, um, um, so on. Anyway, so, so you can find those circular chains in there, okay? Uh, process two uh, is not directly involved in uh, the circular chain, but unfortunately it can't finish off because um, it needs a resource two, which is currently held by process zero, which you can see here. Um, and, um, you know, as we know, you know, process zero is in a deadlock, so unfortunately uh, process two can't get uh, that resource, uh, process two can't get that resource too. So it's also um, kind of uh, in this deadlock uh, indirectly in this case. Um, all right, so um, kind of back to uh, a few words about the programming um, assignment. Um, so, you know, so, so that's the format of these .sim files. Um, um, so, you know, your job, uh, as in the previous assignments, is, you know, uh, you have to read one of these in from the command line. So if in the, if for this uh, assignment, there's no additional command line parameters beside the simulation file. And then the output is simple, you know. So either it's a deadlock or no de deadlock. So if you, if you run the deadlock detection algorithm, there's no deadlock, you're just going to output no deadlock on standard output. If you do detect a deadlock, you're going to output deadlock, and then you need to list the processes. You know, in the processes that end up being unmarked, you're going to list. Okay. So um, uh, as before, I, you know, I give you um, some example code uh, that you can use that will open up and read in the the file of the system states uh, into some standard C uh, arrays. That you can do the pro to do the processing. So to to do this uh, assignment, then basically you're going to have to create. You know, you have to do this algorithm, the deadlock detection algorithm. You're going to have to create uh, your your um, W uh, vector and keep track of that. You're going to have to keep track of which processes are marked and unmarked, um, and um, so on. All right. So uh, that's it. Um, Hopefully that will give you some ideas on how to get started, or at the very least um, will help you understand what the deadlock detection algorithm is all about and, and how you do that. Uh, you might see some questions like that. You might have to be asked to do perform some deadlock detection algorithms on the test or the uh, written assignments, for example. So, um, okay, so that's it. Uh, well, good luck then.